directors managing directors executive directors members of the managing committee our fellow members of iba pikki and all other senior officials representing banks rbi and media i am here again your host pooja it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome each one of you to the day 2 of the iba fikki annual banking conference fibeck 2023 to start with our first panel discussion for the day on the topic fintechs strengthening governance economic and scalability may i now welcome the eminent panel of speakers and request them to please come to the dais shri devashish purohit co head and md investment banking bank of america श्री अनुव्रता विश्वास एम डी एन सी ई ओ एयरटेल पेमेंट बैंक श्री सभ्य साची गोस्वामी सी ई ओ परफ्योज श्री आदिल शेट्टी फाउंडर एन सी ई ओ बैंक बाजार श्री पराग बीसे सी ई ओ एंड एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर न्यूक्लियस सॉफ्टवेयर श्री एम एन श्रीनिवासु co-founder buildesk and our moderator for this session madam neetu chitkara managing director and partner bcg may i request madam neetu chitkara to initiate the panel discussion over to you ma'am yes ma'am a very good morning to everyone we have this interesting topic today on strengthening fintechs on governance economics and scalability i think anyone in the fintech community will believe this is possibly you know the holy grail or or you know the most important trinity as you look at fintechs in india and i think each of them are really important as we look at you know the fintech environment but each of them have also evolved very differently in the context of fin fintechs of course we have a very illustrious panel to discuss that and debate it in detail but i just wanted to set a bit of context by bringing some data and inputs to the table and a lot of this is uh, coming from uh, the surveys we had done so we had last year done a report with matrix partners uh, talking to almost 100 plus stakeholders in the ecosystem uh, and then we did one this year as well Uh, and what you'll see is interesting findings from both the years uh, as we spoke to you know many of the stakeholders um, last year when we had done it in august 22 profitability was possibly you know that was the first report which started to talk about profitability and i think no one right now is asking the question of why profitability so we'll not even venture into it just to show the data itself right last year when we had asked the uh, you know fintechs the number of respondents who believe that they would be profitable in the next 2 to 3 years the answer was only 20 to 30% and that time et had also picked it up that only 20 to 30% fintechs believe that they will turn profitable now the number is 60 to 70% when you we are discussing this informally sometimes people said that is it that they've actually focused on profitability or or they've learned how to answer surveys better so i guess the jury is uh, you know out on that but we do believe that this is at least come very much in the center stage of conversation in terms of you know how the fintechs are approaching things and this is across sector so whether you look at it shortex neo banking and and so on uh, across the board we are starting and uh, seeing a very huge focus on profitability of course some of the sectors so you see paytex right at the bottom you know there are differences by sectors b2b versus b2c i think most of us will realize have very different challenges as as they look at profitability and we will explore some of those differences the second one which is more interesting and i guess uh, here at least people have been uh, if i would say in the surveys they've been very honest because when you look at governance 
we asked the people that how would you, fintechs, how would you compare your own governance versus, let's say, incumbents? And last time, the answer was less than 20%. And even now, uh, only about 27% believe that their governance levels are at par with you know, the, uh, the incumbents per se. So many of them still believe that, yes, there are governance gaps. Given what's happening in the ecosystem more broadly, uh, we have seen that, uh, you know, that leads to many challenges, uh, you know, the governance lapses, et cetera. And therefore, it is, there is a lot to learn in terms of even basics that, let's say, many of the fintechs may need to, you know, look at. I guess the debate here many times that comes on is to say that, uh, when you, many of the innovation that fintechs are able to do is because they are, you know, trying to do a lot of things quickly. Um, but does that mean that you still not have basic safeguards in place? And that's the debate we're going to talk about in terms of governance. And the last one is in terms of scalability. Uh, and here, you know, this is almost the culmination of many different factors uh, to be able to reach that scale. Of course, again, the, the panel that we have today are a lot of people who've already reached that scale, so I guess many of them can recount their journey. Uh, but when we talk about fintechs, I think many of them continue to say product expansion, profitability, these are things which are top of mind for us to scale. On the other hand, the biggest challenges that we see is, you know, let's say regulatory, and again, what we've seen in the recent times is uh, is an ex excellent example that how do you really look at business models in the context of regulations and even, you know, CAC or the entire customer acquisition costs. So with that, I would uh, move to the panel discussion. I think few areas that we will cover, as I said, economics, governance, and scalability. We'll try to peel the onion a layer at a time. So really look forward to an interesting discussion. I think this is good. So I think let's first start with the very hot topic of economics uh, and profitability. And maybe let me start with you, Sabya. Uh, you have recently turned profitable. It came in the news. Many people don't know that you were actually profitable pre-COVID. So you want to talk about some of that journey and you know what it takes? Thanks, Neetu. So I think uh, first things first, uh, we believe in keeping it simple and not complex. What does that mean? Um, Everything that comes your way, it looks attractive, doesn't mean you have to jump in. So I, as a company, our DNA has been measured growth instead of rapid growth. So I think if you put that in perspective, what does that mean is that you have to see the outcome of what you are trying to disrupt. And specifically, we are a tech-first company, so in technology, many things look uh, very, very attractive, most often than not, uh, but you need to understand are you actually solving the pain point for the future or just currently what is there around you to distract? So I think if you focus very much, which we believed and we focused, and I think that shows clearly in what uh, the outcomes are. The second is the cost discipline. Uh, though it is much debated and discussed topic today, but from day one, the DNA of our company has been keep it simple, be frugal, be nimble, and do not splurge. So there's a difference between, uh, between splurging and investing. So of course, in the areas that requires attention, you need to invest. That doesn't mean that you need to splurge. As far as you know that clear distinction, uh, the results are out there again. So I think these are two uh, key differentiators for us, and we have seen the experience how we have grown over years. And the third part that I would say is keeping the culture alive. Uh, by that, what I mean is any company in this space, uh, ideally you are thinking of innovating something new. So the culture of innovation has to stay. Uh, once you scale, you cannot lose that idea of innovating again and again. It is not once that you achieve, you forget it. It's a journey. So you, you need to keep reinventing yourself as an organization, as a team and innovating and come out with new stuff. If you're able to do all these three in tandem, you're supposed to be profitable. Makes sense. I'm going to get Adil here on this one, and I'll give you the mic. Uh, is uh, in terms of, uh, I, I mean, um, Sabia talked about splurge. As a B2C fintech, 
is that a choice that you have versus not given CACs are important and how do you think about profitability? Yeah, so like you rightly said at Bank Bazaar, we believe that um, uh, for a fintech business, keeping the customer acquisition cost low uh, is key to profitability. It's one of the main things one needs to accomplish. Uh, and one needs to be able to engage and build a consumer base. So today, you know, at Bank Bazaar, we have a 60 million consumer base, but the base is uh, built offering uh, free services to consumers. So it could be check your credit score for free, uh, check what all the mortgage rates are, fixed deposit rates are. So it doesn't require so much of a splurge because the consumers are coming to the platform because they're looking and they're savvy and they want this kind of information. In terms of profitability, I think one also needs to look at it from the bank side. So what we've realized, right, and you know, we've really gone deep into co-branded businesses like co-branded credit cards, that the key to it is to keep the fixed costs at zero. You know, if you can make a promise to the bank that you will not need to hire any, any human infrastructure, you don't need to build, invest, capex, nothing, but yet we can build a program and you get access to these millions and millions of new consumers via fintech. I think it's been a very, very powerful proposition because the path to profitability happens in half the time compared to if the bank was going through building all the fixed costs, all the expenses, because here the bank does what it's good at, then the fintech does what it's good at, and you hit profitability very quickly. Yeah, I think both points very relevant. Let me get the other, uh, you know, uh, so both Vasu and Parag in, into this, and you know, you've obviously been fintechs before the word fintech itself was, was coined. Uh, and you know, from profitability perspective, how did you see that, you know, over time? And are there certain, uh, I would say, magic ingredients per se that you ingrained right from the beginning to be able to look at profitability from the start? Okay. Um, thanks, Neetu. Uh, so, uh, as you said, we've been in this for last more than 30 years now. We, at that time, the world fintech was not there, but uh, we were... We call ourselves among the first fintechs because at that time, the environment was somewhat similar, if not the same, because there were a lot of NBFCs which were coming up. Everyone required uh, technology solutions which were not there. So, so the environment was similar. Uh, we also went public very early. So, so there was a lot of funding available. But what I heard at that time, and I was much younger and far less experienced, uh, from our founder who happens to be right here, is that uh, this is our investor's money and you have to keep it, uh, you have to spend it very, very wisely. So that has stayed uh, in our minds. So that's, that's one part of it. Uh, the second part is uh, we always, always focused on the fundamentals. And uh, which, which uh, uh, when I talk about fundamentals, it is both on the financial side as well as on the technology side because it is fintech, so you have to uh, keep. Uh, so uh, I, I have no hesitation in saying that when I started my journey, uh, learned from the leaders in the market at that time, which happened to be Citibank. Many of us started our journey, journey from there, Citibank technology. And what we learned there, uh, the kind of controls, the kind of measures, the engineering discipline has all stayed with us and that has helped uh, us to uh, stay always profitable because the focus on fundamentals is very, very key. Thank you. Pass uh, I think uh, uh, to add into what Parag said, I think businesses that were built in earlier years had a different market environment, so maybe it, it's no longer relevant even to talk of what drove our uh, models. But fundamentally, I think for businesses that have been built in the last 10 years within the space that is now called FinTech, capital has been a big driver. Uh, the demands or expectations of capital has been one of the fundamental reasons. I don't think no, no entrepreneur, nobody starts off to say, I'm going to build a business that will be the profit making or loss making. You're building a business. And then you're delivering to expectations that help you grow. Last decade has been about surplus cap, available, uh, uh, capital availability and uh, growth has been the primary metric. So that's the way companies have grown. So, so in an environment where uh, funding becomes uh, a tighter or, or a funding winter, as one would call it, metrics change. Uh, I personally believe it, it's very easy to swing that if capital were to change its outlook again. That said, to the earlier uh, panel's reactions, my view is this. 
in what is called the fintech space, there are companies with different business models to the point that you made there are B2C companies, B2B companies. But fundamentally, I think there are two kinds of companies, people who are doing tech services and people who are doing ethically what would become banking services. So fintech is a term that will survive for some time, but companies will make the choices of being either becoming tech companies or banking companies. And if there's one metric fintechs need to focus on, I think it's not so much profitability, but gross margin. Profitability is going to be a lot more in control based on business, to the point Adil made, uh, controlling your CAC or other aspects is going to be in your hand. Uh, you dilute on gross margin, it's tough to get back. Very interesting. I'm going to get Devashish in because I think you raised a point that, you know, we were building businesses in a different era. So, you know, for the fintechs, and there may be many in the room which actually were born, let's say, in the area where there was surplus capital, and you've now taken many of them, uh, you know, sort of public. How do you, in, so let's say you are not profitable at this point, and some of them have still gone public. What are then the markers that investors still look for? You know, one, of course, if you hit profitability, but even if you don't, let's say, or even on paths to profitability, what makes that credible to be able to say that, you know, th this is probably something which we can invest in? Yeah. It's, it's very interesting because I think if you look at, uh, see, I've been in this market for almost two decades. I've seen multiple cycles, so which is why you probably can make sense through one particular cycle, which we're in the middle of. And particularly last three years is, uh, I think we've seen both ends of the cycle, right? Uh, the haters of 2021 where um, profitability was a bad word from a public market investor's perspective. No one wa wanted to talk about profitability. Um, I, I think companies were getting priced off TAM uh, and revenue rather than, you know, anywhere down in the p &L, uh, uh, line. Um, I think the class of 2022, I think the narrative shifted to the so-called path to profitability, which is I don't know whether I'll be profitable next year, but I can tell you that in three years' time, I can guide you towards a certain profitability, which was acceptable at that point of time, particularly in Indian markets, because Indian markets were still buoyant, relatively speaking, whereas the U.S. had collapsed. Um, come this year, 2023, I think the narrative has clearly shifted in favor of uh, I don't want your path to profitability. You need to have a demonstrated profitability. Um, now, the question is, is demonstrated profitability uh, is an absolute profitability for a certain period uh, or other markets and investors will give you the benefit of the doubt? Um, I think the, the answer you know, lies in somewhere in between. I think if you have uh, a demonstrated profitability for a few quarters, call it two to three, three to four, uh, and show the bridge from a certain level of profitability into an eventual steady state profitability, uh, I think investors will give you the benefit of that, that doubt. Because even from a public market landscape, uh, you know, any mutual fund, FIs, long only you speak to, I think people have, uh, you know, uh, turned a lot more fundamental and bottom stuff. And they're doing almost private equity style diligence, even while evaluating, you know, go to market public companies. Uh, so building like a 10 year DCF model. And one extremely important input into that is that what is your steady state margins? So if you can articulate that, have some early signs of uh, uh, deliverability and build a bridge, uh, I think you'll get the benefit of the doubt. So that's what we see. The second nuance is that if you look at most fintech players, um, you know, they're platform operators and with multiple verticals, uh, with each vertical in a different stage of evolution and maturity. Uh, and in a way, uh, investors also look at them as a sum of the part story. If, if in, in that kind of a platform, it's extremely important. Your, your core business, core offering, have to be profitable. Um, and you can build a horizon one and horizon two of early stage investment versus futuristic investment within a certain guardrail, which uh, doesn't call for questions around capital allocation. So that is the other important aspect of valuing going to uh, uh, public companies from an investor standpoint. No, very helpful. And I think this capital allocation starting to come even in fintech terminology, I think is, is very important rather than, you know, let's try it all and see what fits. So I think very useful. I'm going to get you, Anubrat, in at this stage. And I think on two questions simultaneously, I think one just closing in on profitability and, you know, obviously you are in a space which is actually, uh, you know, defined by profitability from a license itself, right? Of working as a, as a payment bank. Um, how do you see that once you're constrained in a certain way, 
uh, you know, how does profitability pan out there? And then I think the second one is more on governance because you're probably, you know, the most, uh, you know, strongly governed entity, again, from a payment bank license perspective. What are best practices that you see, uh, again, which would be very relevant from a, you know, fintech perspective? Okay, so probably the toughest phrasing, uh, Neetu, of, <laughs> of, the, of the question, but let me segue into it. Um, while the panel was speaking, I think there are three, four broad areas which I'll quickly comment on. First is the nature of the license itself and therefore the uh, thought of what business is possible. Uh, when 2016 the licenses were issued, 2017, 2018, a lot of players got off the block. It was fairly clear that uh, this is not going to be a business which is event driven. Uh, Adil's business is an event driven business, a consumer takes a loan, he gets a fee out of it. Uh, the payment back license by its very de design was a continuous engagement business. Uh, that was one important variable when we started looking at what we are going to do, what's the imagination we're going to apply. The second variable is that look in a banking business, uh, unfortunately your fixed cost structure is uh, not designed to be tweakable to a large extent. You've got your cost of core banking, you've got your cost of compliance, uh, and therefore, by design, these two variables determine the model, which is that you must hit scale. And Neetu, early 2017, 2018, we were tossing around ideas of, you know, something which we used to internally call a Dhaiso Tinso model, which is essentially Tinso Rupiya ka earning, Dhaiso Rupiya ka kharcha. Um, it's also pertinent to point out that it was a business built on the strengths of a telecom parent. And therefore, we believe we built a very uh, different model where we call a consumer or define a consumer with his ARPU, which is a very telecom terminology. I'll give you a sense of this. Today, in fact, last month, we just crossed uh, six crore monthly transacting users across a wide range of platforms. Uh, be it uh, B2B platforms, be it individuals transacting, be it bank account users. Uh, and these are six crore monthly transacting users. We typically tend to earn 24 to 25 rupees per month per user. And our earnings are offset by our costs, which of course, in the first few years of operation were higher than that revenue. Uh, equally revenue has grown, of course. Uh, but the cost today are around 19 to 20 rupees. So that, in a nutshell, is, I think the constraint itself was a great opportunity because it defined the way we looked at the user and we quickly realized that India is a macro. Uh, it is not possible to have only banks serving 300, 350 million consumers, taking them on the folds of financial inclusion. And financial inclusion is not just opening a bank account, it's actually making a consumer use formal banking for all his or her financial needs. And therefore, you need a large range of players. And we quickly realized that we are in the sweet spot of what we would call being a regulated fintech. Um, the regulated uh, fintech is very unique because in India, there are three pieces which were very difficult to discover together. First is sustainability. Second is scale. And third is growth. You will find it very difficult in the fintech sector in India to get all three together consistently year on year. So just in this perspective, Airtel Payments Bank today is six crore users. We've got scale. Uh, we are running at around 1,800 crores of ARR revenue, sustainable. And we have CAGR across metrics of 40 to 50 percent over the last four or five years. Finally, our view is that you don't necessarily start a business to be profitable. You start a business to really solve a problem which you feel passionate about. And that's what uh, you know, we are doing today. Uh, we are in the lengths and breadths of India. Just to give you a sense, uh, less than 2,000 population villages. There are half a million villages in India. Half of them are banked by Airtel Payment Bank today. That's the sort of scale in rural. In urban India, we are actually the fastest growing digital bank, fastest growing uh, sort of digital book, fastest growing acquisition. And finally, I want to close with the point which Adil raised on customer acquisition. We fundamentally have a very, very low cost of consumer acquisition because we are rooted in a very 
deep rich ecosystem of distribution technology and consumers of a telecom player. Um, coming back to the point around governance, maybe I'll just sort of end with it. Um, again, governance is not, in our opinion, a necessary thing. It is actually an enabler. First and foremost, we are an RBA regulated entity. Uh, we need to ensure that we act in the highest standards and best possible outcomes for the consumer. Second, I think the board has been very clear, and this is the point which I want to raise in the slide also which you mentioned on governance and the board compositions. The board's also always been very clear that it's going to be a diversified public company, and therefore the design of the board, the percentage of independent directors, all of that gets very important when you think about the mix. And from day zero, we've set ourselves up like that. In fact, out of the top 50 fintechs in India, we did a quick scan. 40 of them, the number of independent directors actually are lesser than the number of um, you know, promoter directors or shareholder directors. So you know, setting up the vision of the next three to five years and what does it take today from a governance standard is important because you have to sort of chalk out the journey before you start walking. Very helpful. I'll get Parag on this one. Parag, again, you know, there was a point where you went public. So did you see a difference, let's say, when you're in the run-up to being public? Uh, you know, in your governance, few of the things that you had to kind of implement just to, uh, you know, keep in mind the public markets? Uh, well, I would say not really because, as I said earlier, uh, from the day one, uh, we were... Uh, clear uh, that we would focus on the fundamentals, both on the, whether it's financial, whether it is governance, uh, or uh, whether it's the engineering discipline, which is also in governance, uh, uh, that's more internal. Uh, so I won't say uh, uh, there was a difference before we went public and after we went public, because uh, I think the guiding principles have been the same uh, all throughout, and that probably uh, also was the reason why we went public so early. And uh, uh, of course, uh, after that, uh, one key thing uh, uh, that has happened is uh, the, the selection uh, or the onboarding of board members has been also a very key thing for us because uh, uh, I think we've been very uh, cautious they are to, to take members who are from different, they're like uh, from uh, illustrious background in education uh, or government or corporate uh, for that matter. So that, that has helped us in uh, focusing on governance as well. Very helpful. Uh, and this one is maybe to all three, Adil, Sabya, as well as Vasu, you deal with multiple banks, multiple fintechs. Uh, and, and I guess you see varying levels of governance across, you know, the ecosystem players that, that you work with. Any best practice examples or perhaps any red flags that you have seen across? You don't need to name, uh, you know, the players, but uh, these are the kind of obvious lapses that you saw, or on the other side, these are the best practices even as fintechs that you saw in terms of governance. So I think uh, there are many uh, but in the interest of time, maybe I'll cite a couple of them. Uh, the first one that I think uh, what is very important from a governance standpoint and what we see across uh, the entire, all four pillars of finance is how do you uh, deal with the customer data because we are largely on that side and where the policymakers are definitely doing their bit. But what I have seen, the progressive financial institutions also are building guardrails to manage that much uh, much more effectively, better way than what they were doing a decade back at least. So I think that sense has set in uh, and that awareness has been created uh, in the overall ecosystem from a consumer to a financial institute. And I think all the enabling players in that space is also aligning to that. So that's a forward-looking move, I think, from a governance standpoint. The next is, what I see is, earlier people were a little reluctant about being very transparent in terms of the observability from a technology standpoint. Now that's also a governance element because what happens is, it was a dark hole. 
So you don't know what is happening. Everybody is questioning, okay, what went wrong? Everybody is giving some answers. You're wanting to believe on that. So I think people have opened up. People are gearing up to being more transparent, showing what is actually happening behind the scene. And I think people are trusting each other. So that the governance has also helped in building trust between both sides on the fintech and on the uh, banking system. So I think these two are the core things that I would cite for now, but there are many such initiatives which is happening. I perhaps have a slightly more critical view of uh, where perhaps the industry stands. Two things. One is, uh, uh, I'll just draw a parallel to Builders. We, Builders founders worked in organizations before founding the company. And we all worked in organizations which were very mature, very, uh, and the governance had already evolved. So that's where we learned, right? So starting a uh, business with high level of governance came naturally. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a choice. It came naturally, right? If you look at fintech companies over the last decade, I just take the last decade, many of them, for many of them, it's the first job, the first business they're building. So uh, governance is structurally something new or something as a cho it works as a choice. A lot of it has got enforced in, in recent times through compliance procedures. And that's where I draw a distinction uh, to points that Bia is making. I think till governance becomes a philosophy, you don't really reach governance in a good state, right? Currently, the, the industry is in a mode of, I know there's a regulatory expectation of governance that is being defined by certain compliance standards. How do I get there? Uh, it helps through audits and the regulatory process, but I don't think it gets you to uh, deal with situations that are not defined under compliance. So I think that's one gap that startups or any fintech company needs to think through. A, there's a compliance need, but what do I truly want as a governance standard? Because there will be situations like these that come up. Uh, I also believe sticking to high levels of governance means you give up some businesses, you give up some opportunities, even if your competition is addressing them. Right? Uh, that, that's going to be a very tough choice to make because normally most sessions where I attend, people have this question. I know that's not the right thing to do, but I see competitors doing it. Regulator doesn't seem to act on that, so why shouldn't I do it? And uh, you just have to make those choices. And I think... Uh, uh, and, the only input I have to fintechs, if there are any in this room, is to say that uh, governance catches up over time. Meaning, if you kind of take small steps saying it's okay to kind of breach this time, but somehow or overlook governance, it can catch up with you in 10 years' time. It's, it, governance has long memories. So uh, it's simplest to build a good quality business with high focus on governance. Yeah, we can see that. I think people go into Sorry, the details. If I can add one more thing, and uh, Vasu touched actually a very, very critical point there that uh, what, what I touched in the first measured growth, so you can't do all business that comes your way. You have to be very clear. But the second point is governance or compliance comes with a cost. So I think people forget that element that when you try to comply to everything and you set internal standards that you want to operate at a certain benchmark, certain quality, certain governance standards, it is expensive. I think overall India as an economy, we feel it is just, you can do it. It's not like that. So it has to be in your DNA. As a company, we had that 15 years back, we invested, but we end up justifying to everybody in the system why it is expensive. Today, probably people are realizing that, okay, it is need of the hour, but it was always need of the hour. It will be, but it comes with a certain degree of cost. Very helpful, and I think the part that, you know, don't think that you will reach a certain scale and then you'll think about governance, that, that doesn't hold. Adil? So I think there were great answers from Anubrata, uh, you know, Vasu and uh, Sabya. So I'll try and share a slightly different perspective. So as a fintech, I think there are two parallel tracks. So one track is a lot of the new regulation uh, is directly applicable to fintech. So examples are a digital lending uh, guideline, uh, digital privacy guideline, the new Digital India Act, which is under draft format. So as a fintech, you have to comply with it directly. So I think that's one angle that's driving uh, governance. The other angle is most fintechs partner with banks, and I think that provides a great guardrail because the bank has decades of experience maintaining governance, compliance, and risk management. And I think it becomes an incredible opportunity when a fintech partners with a bank because 
that stability, that framework, that governance comes from the bank side, which allows the fintech to scale by focusing on consumer, focusing on AI, focusing on data. So those are the two parts I'm seeing play out. Very helpful. I'm going to get Debashish in at this point um, in terms of just the last point on governance, which is that you said, you know, many of the people are already now doing due diligence when you invest and so on. What are the red flags that you see? Uh, you know, the moment you see this in a fintech and you said, I'm not going to touch it with a barge pole. So, and I guess even for the banks in the room, right? Because while you're not investing, honestly, in terms of your own bandwidth, in terms of the technology integration, it is still an investment on your time. So, how do you, you know, outside in or, you know, even with some information, start to look at red flags uh, in terms of governance uh, when you look at a fintech? Yeah, I think there are, uh, there are obvious red flags and there are probably red flags which can't be defined or can't be measured. Um, I think, uh, you know, my view is that within the broader tech space, whether it's consumer tech or fintech, I think fintech probably have a higher um, desirable governance bar for two reasons. Uh, first one, I think fintech, uh, given um, the space they operate in, particularly true for consumer-facing uh, uh, fintech, also true for enterprise-facing as well, I think the biggest element they uh, have to build is trust because you're in the money business, you're in payments, transaction, advisory. Uh, you know, it's like you can, on the consumer tech side, I mean, you can buy something on a horizontal platform, you don't like it, you return it, right, and you move on. Uh, here, you can't because the bar is higher. Um, and trust is something which can't be built overnight. I mean, it takes uh, ages and years. Uh, the second aspect, which is uh, which is Adil, uh, you know, kind of brought out, is that you know ultimately it's a regulated business, so you need to stand up to the regulatory scrutiny and the high bar which the regulator expects of you. And how can you build a trust-based business without having the best governance standards? So it's kind of it's not even a must-have. Uh, and also the other point is to Vasu's point again, and that is probably the biggest red flag which most investors look for. You may have the best governance apparatus and architecture in terms of independent board members, uh, board-driven committees, um, you know, the best risk practices. But if it is not there in the culture and DNA of the management team and the founder, down to the last employee uh, on the payroll, or the intent is missing, um, then I think no amount of governance architecture can help you. And this is probably the soft red flag most investors look for and probably the most difficult to spot out. The letter versus spirit in, in, in some sense, absolutely. So with that, I guess we'll move to the last, you know, set of questions around scalability and, you know, how do you look at, uh, you know, scalability for some of the fintechs going forward? Uh, and I guess, again, this, this side of the table has all lived through that journey. Uh, but any, I would say, pointers in terms of when you were kind of traversing that journey, what are the trade-offs that you looked at in terms of both positives as well as challenges and any tips or, uh, you know, inputs from that? Uh, maybe we can start from here and go straight up. So maybe... So maybe a couple of quick points on that. Uh, one, I already spoke about the fact that, you know, at Bank Bazaar being a partner, collaborative, banking-focused organization, the fact that the uh, banking uh, system was so scalable, capital was available, the desire to grow was there, I think really, really helped a lot. I think a big opportunity uh, going forward, right, is India still remains um, a, a, a place where to get access to high quality credit products is not that easy. So just to give you an example, right, China has one billion credit cards in force, uh, one billion. Uh, now, that's more than 10 times what India has. But the challenge is always, how do you do this while ensuring that the issuer is profitable? So it's not a very easy question to solve because clearly, uh, you know, last year, uh, uh, spends went up 41%, three-year, CAGRs about 30% in India. The opportunity is huge. But how do you, uh, 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 you know, price in such a way that the issuer makes uh, their uh, uh, return uh, without burning their fingers. So I think there's an incredible opportunity in the next 50 to 100 million consumers. These consumers all have a prime or a super prime credit score. So I would argue that it's very different from 2008. Everyone knows if I don't pay, uh, I'll be locked out of the credit 
and the credit score system. So people want to pay. Uh, and the opportunity is, can we target these greater than 750 score consumers who've not taken a credit card before, uh, are new to credit card, and can we build a profitable business? That I think is an incredible scale opportunity. So Nitu, uh, I, I think if you look at our journey of scale, two pieces we can look at. One is the uh, portfolio approach. Uh, there were certain businesses which, uh, am I audible? It's better? Is this better now? All right. There was a portfolio approach where we started with a B2B business. Uh, we digitized over a billion dollars of cash uh, monthly. Um, and that was our first profitable business. It allowed our rural business to grow, and today it's allowing our urban digital business to grow. The second is, I think, uh, from a management team point of view, keeping an eye on the composition of revenue streams is extremely important because it's very difficult to have a monoline revenue stream really allowing you to break even. I'm sure Adil has his cross-sell revenue streams and all of that, which is impactful. Uh, but if you look at the bank, uh, roughly four years back, transaction income was 90%. Today, transaction income is 70%. Deposit income is 10%. Fee income is 20 so uh, the real test of a model and whether the strategy is working is how the revenue streams are changing over time. That gives you a good direction. In terms of the future scale, I do have two points to make, and I want to make a context statement here. First is, if you look at 2000 to 2010 and 2010 to 2020, GDP of India broadly doubled. You look at all the metrics of digital India, Digital India grew four times from 2000 to 2010. But 2010 to 2020, something very interesting happened. Digital India actually grew eight times, which means the rate of acceleration of Digital India is actually moving up, while the GDP rate, of course, you know, many people other than me have predicted it's going to be 7 to 8% over the next 25 years. The second point is that you have the population replacement rate at 2.1, which it hit in 2019, which basically means all GDP increase will result directly in per capita income increase. Put these two together, you really have a situation where you're going to have 250, 300 million viable consumers coming onto the fold, for which you need two things. One, you need a economic model where fintechs find it viable to offer propositions to these consumers. Right now in India, the payment market is significantly distorted where the digital public infrastructure has resulted in almost a zero cost of service, but equally almost a zero revenue, which makes it very difficult for payment fintechs in particular. The second is that if you look at this 250, 300 million opportunity, you need new types of lenders, more capital, stronger balance sheets to come in with play. Um, we do believe payment banks have a conversation to uh, really offer there where a limited set of lending approvals or an ability for payment banks to lend would really allow 100 million consumers to come into the formal folds. Yeah. Uh, no, I think completely agree with you, Anubrata. Um, you know, if you look at India as an opportunity, right, I think India is the, by far, the most exciting uh, commerce as well as financial services opportunity on planet Earth, full stop. Uh, because if you look at the construct of the Indian market, right, I think, what, 30 to 40 percent of our GDP comes from the MSME segments, which is probably people are still kind of scratching the surface. Um, uh, it's 1.4, 1.5 billion population probably by the turn of this decade, we could be a $10 trillion credit opportunity. Uh, we're being serviced by, what, five large banks and a couple of large NBFCs. I mean, look at China and US, for example, right? So there is a massive space for uh, traditional lenders and fintechs to play. The other important thing is India is a largely unorganized market, and the switch from unorganized to organized is to be, is the digital journey, which we're seeing with the infrastructure in place. So I, I don't think it's difficult, it's not difficult to build business scale in India with this kind of a population, this kind of TAM, uh, and the digital and social infrastructure which exists. 
I think the challenge in India, which is again coming down to the market terms, I think we have a $150 billion market cap bank. In the next five years, do we see a 40 to $15 million fintech market cap opportunity? And the answer to that is that how much of this market potential is monetizable? I think there are signs of that happening, particularly last year or so, I think with the regulatory tailwind. Uh, I think um, uh, the propensity of service users to pay uh, we're seeing those in the merchant space, for example. I think Soundbox is a classic example. Um, and, uh, and, and how do you add the other revenue streams and make it probably a $500, $750 million, who knows, a billion dollar uh, bottom line opportunity for you to be a 30, 40 market cap uh, opportunity. Um, and you know, by the way, I think we speak to a lot of fintechs globally. Uh, in my view is that in terms of sheer innovation, India stands right on the top of the fintech world. And that's because, drawing a parallel to the cricket world, and the Indian fintech founders and players have not been given a flat track. I think when you start of the journey as a zero interchange, you've got to innovate. Uh, the real challenge is that, how do you monetize those opportunities uh, to be a real uh, bottom line and hence a market cap outcome? Very helpful and very brave of you to take a cricket analogy right now, but yeah. No, I, I think this has been by far the most interesting part of this panel in terms of how we think of scalability. So I want to repeat the points already made, but just to put a couple of data points. Uh, digital India has actually been defined by digital payments and by extension UPI. 60% uh, of all retail payments today are on UPI. 90% of all incremental transactions are digital UPI, which under a government mandate is a free service book and you can't charge for it directly or indirectly, which even covers for any indirect forms of monetization. So effectively, it's a question of what are you scaling on? For, from a fintech's perspective, right? You can scale on various metrics, but you cannot scale on revenue or profits. Uh, so there's that first, I think the most interesting part for any fintech to address is what do you want to scale on? And what choices do you have? Given that payments is where it is, for almost every fintech player, the, the the most viable way to think of uh, scaling either on revenues or on margins or profits is the lending, right? Uh, which essentially means India being the way it is, the hyper-competitive market it is, it, it's going to be a bit of time before people can profitably scale in that segment, just because there's a rush. The, the last aspect is even as fintechs try to scale, there is a context of how banks will play the space, right? Uh, there is a difference between uh, banking players' share of traditional banking products versus the, their digital market share. They're hugely skewed. One reasonable reality, and Devash is perhaps a better person who answers, as, as any economy goes digital and uh, people build businesses, it becomes a narrower and narrower game with the top three, four, getting more dominant shares of market than the wider tail, right? So from, what I do believe is from in Indian market, focusing on FinTech, uh, companies have to figure what they want to scale on, and uh, building a scalable business as opposed to having a, a, a number metric is easier to imagine today uh, or measurable today. And inevitably, I think there needs to, there will have to be consolidation before one can speak of a profitable way to scale in India. So I think what worked for us and I think most companies may be uh, walking the same footsteps. The first thing on a data point, I think from an India perspective, the fintechs, the digital adoption uh, is far, far, far better globally uh, when it comes to India. We are 23% ahead uh, than the global average from adoption. So that itself is a clear uh, adoption itself is helping all the fintechs uh, achieve the scale. That's by default. The second bit what I think is to have a flexible tech infrastructure. Because today if you see technology, it's changing like almost every year, every two years. You can't have a legacy architecture or infrastructure on which you plan to scale. So it has to be very, very flexible. The third is, I think instead of compete, it is co -op team. So you collaborate and you work with strategic partners or partners. I think if these three are there, at least in a decent middle to long run, you will be able to scale. Otherwise, it's maybe for a very short run that you'll be able to scale. You have to 
keep growing and sustain the scale, I think these three are very, very critical part. One, you don't control so much because the adoption is driven by multiple macro factors. But the other two from a flexible tech infra and the collaborating and not to compete and have strategic partnership is the second bit. The rest we have already spoken, which is whether you have a cost discipline, whether you have all of that, we have already spoken. But I think these three are key parameters we want to scale. Um, yeah, I, I think in a country like India, scalability is like, there are, there are so many ways and I agree that I think uh, uh, institutions need to decide on uh, what to scale on. Uh, for instance, uh, despite being there uh, for three decades uh, and uh, you know, we could have done anything in the BFI sector, BFSI sector, but we decided to stick to one or two areas. So if it, if the entire sector is, let's say, uh, a mile wide, uh, we decided to focus on an inch and went depth into it. You know, so that that's one. Uh, I think the idea is to identify uh, what do you want to do, create a niche out of it, because. Uh, a lot of, apart from uh, technology, a lot of domain expertise is required, and and uh, uh, for that, yeah, you need to, I think, identify your area, uh, decide whether you want to scale in the width or the depth, and we chose to scale in the depth. Very helpful. And, and India as a country allows you to be able to do that. Yeah, there is, still, there is a long way to go. Market. Uh, thanks so much. And I think we're uh, running very close to the time. So maybe just summarizing, uh, you know, some of the inputs. And I thought it was a really helpful discussion on all three dimensions, right? We started to talk about economics and, and talked about, yes, the models may be different for B2B, B2C. But uh, even in environments where constraints exist, like you gave the example, Adil, of uh, you know, kind of thinking through different streams or, you know, reducing your CAC or, you know, you talked about how you think about each customer's ARPU. So it's also about in the mindset of how you really think about profitability. That perhaps is, you know, possibly the, the most important thing. And that's also, uh, I guess, not just the mindset, but as you rightly talked about, Devashish, that it's not investors are now, first they were talking about growth, now path to profitability, now actual profitability. So I think that's a very important shift uh, to keep in mind. On governance, I think there were really int interesting points raised with respect to, you know, how do you really, like governance as a letter versus spirit? And even, uh, you know, this element of uh, customer data, technology, how in every aspect of what you do, uh, you know, governance is important. It does come with a cost, so, you know, and uh, I think you made an interesting point, Varsu, with respect to, it also means sometimes letting go of, you know, certain opportunities, so that is also, you know, sort of important to think, and not just as later on in my journey, that this is the scale I'll reach, and then I'll think about governance, but, you know, across the board. And finally, I think on scalability, I think, Perhaps there was one common theme running from here to here, which was essentially India as a large country, scale is not going to be a, you know, a problem so long as you get the right uh, you know, problem that you're solving and have a very clear view of how you're actually monetizing or how you're thinking through that uh, problem. So I thought very helpful perspectives across the three areas. Thanks so much to the panelists. And um, I think we are pretty much on time, so we will wrap up at this. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, all dignitaries. May I request all the dignitaries for a group photograph, please? Ladies and gentlemen, before I take you all over to the next session, we shall break for tea now, and we will meet again 11.10 a.m. Tea has been arranged at the outside this hall. When is a day more than just another day?